Hey guys, what's going on? Thank you for joining us. Dog Days Podcast, episode number nine with William Garrido of my dog training is my passion. Um, what's your business name again? It's Canis Fortis Dog Company. Canis Fortis Dog Company. And I think yes, you're sir. out of Texas. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Texas. Okay. okay. Yeah. So how's everything been going for you? Good. Everything's been going good. Um, you know, things are as usual. My dog Russ got his two a couple or a few weekends ago. So we finished the second leg. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, in general everything's going pretty well. Yeah. Cool, cool. How many how many dogs are you trialing? Because I seen you posted something else about like a dog and a one. Yeah, I have uh so I got three dogs. Three personal dogs that are, you know, that I train for PSA, but two of them are still, still kind of young. You know, they're, they don't have anything yet. They're not, you know, they're, they don't have a PDC or anything. Uh, one of them is about a year and a half. The other one is just a little bit older than that. The other one's going to be two in January. So he's almost two. Um, and those two, they're both half brothers They're from the same, from the same dad. Uh, and then I have Rust. Rust is the older one. He's the one that just got his two. He's, um, you know, he's a dog that I got, you know, eight years. He's eight years old. He just turned eight not long ago. So, uh, you know, he was the dog that I got um, sort of to start me into, you know, into, into sports. I'd never done sports before until I got Rust. And, you know, getting Rust... Mm -hmm. We didn't start really trialing until he was about three years old because, you know, the first three years we didn't have a club. I didn't even know what sport we were going to do. So, um, you know, then we kind of started in PSA right, right about when he was about three. Um, so those are the only three dogs that I have. My wife has a Malinois as well, but she's also kind of young. She hasn't done a whole – she hasn't competed yet. Um, but, yeah, those are, the, those are the dogs that we have. Now, in the club – we do have a bunch of, you know, we do have a bunch of dogs. I have some clients also that, that do training PSA, like personal clients, private clients. Uh, and I have a client whose dog got a PDC this year. And that dog, his name is Tango. That one is working towards PSA 1 stuff. So that's probably the one you have seen in some of the videos. He's prepping for level 1 stuff. Yeah, the, the, the dog Tango, did you... Did she come to uh, Florida with them? No, she didn't. She didn't come to Florida. No, oh, she right. got she got his PDC in uh, in Texas in Dallas. Um, but um, but I had some friends that were in Florida that I was talking to. Um, that um, mm -hmm. you know that I think one of them finished her one. Um, and the other one, I think might've gotten her first leg of the one. I mean, this was, you know, back in the beginning of the year, right? Is that when it was? I went when to we Florida met? twice, one time in October last year. And then another time in January, I think. I think it was January. Cause I remember traveling to Florida January. So yeah, it was January. But yeah. Yeah. Those are. Uh, okay. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's probably when I met you. Yep. Yeah. So, um, just a, I just wanted to start off by asking yeah. what, how did you start tra dog training? Who was like your mentor? How did you get into it? And how did that process went like from a kid to present? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's a, that's a good question. So, you know, when I started, I was in my mid twenties. Um, and the reason that, the reason that I went into the dog training industry was because for the prior six years of, you know, of, of my life, you know, from like, uh, you know, from my mid twenties before that, um, I was in the Coast Guard, I was enlisted in the Coast Guard. And, you know, when you enlist in the, you know, in one of the branches, you don't, you don't do year by year. It's like either a four or a six year contract. So my six year enlistment was already coming up and, um, uh, you know, and then I was at, at, at sort of a, turning point where I was like, you know, you can't just keep working until you put your two weeks. You have to either, you know, sign up for another four years, another six years, 
You know what I mean? So it's it's like a major decision almost. I'm familiar. I was in the army. There you go. You know exactly what I'm talking about. So, you know, I was I was in my mid twenties and then I was like, okay, do I re enlist and take it to my you know, into and take this career into my thirties? And, you know, once you do mm-hmm. ten years, you might as well do twenty, right? That's that's what they say. Right, right. So I was like, you know what, I'm gonna go ahead and and just do something else. And so that's when I started looking into dog training. That's when I started looking into, you know, police dogs. That's the first thing that kind of got my attention is the working dogs. So, um, you know, right around that time, I was, I was getting my, my affairs in order to, uh, to end my enlistment. And that's when I found this school in Louisiana. And the school is called uh, US Canine. And to this day, they're still doing training program. Uh, they, you know, they train police dogs, they have pet dogs, but they also have like a, you know, like a, like a mentorship program for people who want to be dog trainers. So I contacted them, mm-hmm. um, you know, and my last duty station was in Louisiana because I was stationed at the, uh, at the air station in, uh, you know, in Bell Chase. So, you know, it wasn't too much of a, okay. too much of a, too much of a distance going from, from the air station in Bell Chase to, you know, to uh, Kaplan, which is where this place is located. So, you know, I went there yeah. and, um, and that was the first school that I went to. It was the first, my first introduction into dog training. And then from that moment on, you know, I, I, uh, I, I did, uh, you know, other schools. So I went to, uh, I went to Starmark Academy, it used to be known Triple Crown Academy. Um, that's what it used to be known mm-hmm. as, but you know, it's now Starmark Academy. So I went there, you know, a few years after US canine. Um, and then from there, you know, I've done some seminars here and there, but the most recent school that I, that I graduated from was Nepopo. So I did Nepopo silver, uh, and I did Nepopo gold early this year. I finished Nepopo gold. So, um, that's pretty much the extent of my formal education, so to speak, in the dog training industry. Okay, yeah, that's cool. I heard you say the Bell Chase. I'm from New Orleans, actually. No kidding. I, uh, I grew up there. Okay. Oh, yeah, nice. yeah, I grew up there um, all my life. I went to uh, John Eric High School okay. on the West Bank. You probably, okay. I don't know if you heard of that, but we, we, yeah, I remember, one of the biggest I remember schools the West Bank, in, yeah. in the state. Cool. That's awesome. Yep, but um, yeah, man. Um, I see that you're like a um really like an educator, more than just like your everyday trainer. You know, like some people are able to train, some people are able to be good handlers, and then other people are like educators. They take their knowledge and they're able to get that knowledge out to other people. And um, I've also seen that you wrote some books and yeah, yeah, stuff like that. I've seen that you how many how many books have you written already? I've written uh, four. Yeah, four books. Four books, yeah. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about each yeah, of those? of course. So the first one I wrote uh, several years ago, and the first one I wrote was called um, Common Myths About Dogs. And it was basically a very, very short, short read. And it's a compilation of a bunch of myths that I've heard my entire career, you know? Um, Mm -hmm. things like, for instance, something stupid, like, you know, a lot of dog trainers are, are, are aware of some of these myths. Like, um, you know, you shouldn't play tug with a dog because playing tug makes them aggressive or, um, you know, um, you know, a bunch of stuff like that. Right. And and so what I did is I just made a compilation of, of those myths that I've been aware of that are completely wrong, or maybe there, there is some truth to them but not in the way that people think. So I made a list of that. And there are also some right. myths, you know, about it, uh, even on the dog trainer side. So I made a list of those. Again, very short read. And that was my first, uh, the first book that I launched that, you know, that I just kind of put my name out there. It was a little bit, it was a little bit scary, you know, writing a book. It seems like, mm-hmm. like there wouldn't be much to it, but it's like you're putting something that is permanent and you're sending it out there for people to scrutinize, right? So 
right. it was a little bit uh it was a little bit uh scary to do especially because you know I, I did it all on my own i didn't have uh i didn't have a um a publisher i didn't have a, an editor you know nobody just they it, it was like i did it all on my own which made it even more scary so i i released that and i got some pretty decent feedback on that so as I was kind of going along and uh, and I was you know thinking okay maybe I could do another one. Um, at the time I had a blog on my website, and the blog was just a bunch of articles you know from dog training to you know some common pet training type of stuff to more complex you know dog trainer information type of thing. So. It was right about that time that I thought to myself, you know what, I'm not going to have this blog forever. At some point, I'm probably going to change the website. So I thought to myself, well, what's going to happen to all these blogs? You know, I'm not going to keep them on a file. So what I decided to do is I decided to compile all of those articles that I wrote in that blog, plus articles that I had written mm -hmm. In other newspapers, you know, local newspapers, same thing, you know, I've written a bunch of articles in, in different newspapers and publications. So I was like, I'm going to put them all together and I'm going to write, you know, I'm going to put it in a, in a book format. And that's the second book I wrote, which is uh, Info Every Dog Trainer Should Know. So it's just a bunch of, you know, blogs and articles um, for more specifically for dog trainers because a lot of the stuff on there is more complex, um, you know, than your average dog train dog owner really cares to know. Um, so that's the second book. Then the third book, uh, the third book is my favorite to this to this day, and the third book is um, is on decoy work. So that one, you know, I wanted to write about you know decoy work more specifically decoy work because. It's something that I do, something that I'm very passionate about. Uh, it's something that um, it's just a topic that that fascinates me. So I decided to write some things on that topic, uh, you know, from preventing injuries, that kind of stuff. So what I did is I got together with a chiropractor, a chiropractor who you know treats athletes, but He's also been treating decoys for like a good number of years in his career. So we got together mm -hmm. with him. I did an interview with him. So that interview is also in the book. And we talk about, you know, how to stay in shape, how to maintain your health, how to maintain your, uh, your structure as a, as a decoy. Uh, but I also went further along. And what I did is I contacted a bunch of decoys in different, you know, in different sports, and a bunch of them are PSA decoys. You know, I interviewed Josh Kirby, right. <laughs> uh, Jeff Riccio, um, you know, Dal Ritchie, and some of the decoys from other, you know, other sports, other disciplines. You know, uh, decoys from mm -hmm. uh, from IGP, Belgian Ring, um, you know, French Ring, and I put all their interviews in that book. So that one is the one that, you know, it, it's my favorite. It, you know, I learned so much just writing the book, you know, interviewing these people. And, um, and, and that one is, um, that one I did get help with. You know, I did have an editor kind of looking over it because I wanted, I wanted it to look more professional because I had other, other people that were contributing to it. And I wanted to make sure that it was, you know, it was a fair representation of them as well. So uh, that one is the third one. And the fourth one is so, uh, another short read. The fourth one is a book on um, how to select the right dog trainer, which is, you know, a topic in itself. Basically, that one is written for pet owners. Um, I know and you know, I'm sure, um, there are a lot of good dog trainers in the industry. There are a lot of bad dog trainers in the industry. And as dog trainers, we know how to spot them. But the average dog owner mm -hmm. doesn't know how to spot the difference, you know, the difference between a really good dog trainer and a very irresponsible, neglectful, uh, and oftentimes abusive dog trainer. The websites a lot of times are, they look similar, that there is no difference, you know, the, 
the person right. that that is right. neglectful that is that doesn't do a good job they don't put that on their website so the average dog owner is kind of left in the dark uh, on that so that book is written for them on how to spot that how to spot the red flags and how to you know how to make the right selection because it's a big deal for the average pet owner Yep, it's definitely hard because there's no governing body to dog training. It's not like you go get a PhD in dog training and you come out and <clears throat> anyone and anybody can um, take on this profession. Like I haven't had any um, formal training, if that makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. I know what you mean. But I've done a lot of like seminars. I haven't been to like a dog training school, but I've been to seminars. I've been mentored by multiple different people. Sure. Um took a few like online courses, some like weekend classes, stuff like that. And just sure. getting little tips from here and there. And then I just kind of engulfed myself. I've been training. Well, I've been into dogs my whole life. I've been around dogs and my dad wasn't a professional trainer, but he mm -hmm. was able to make our dog do basic tricks. He'll sit sure. down, stay calm, speak, yeah, yeah. crawl from like, you know, 50 yards. Yeah. So just as a normal person, that's like impressive. So yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, he had our dogs doing that kind of stuff with, with no knowledge. So yeah. um, <clears throat> I got into the bite work portion in probably 05 uh, or a little bit before. I started seeing him a lot when I was in the military mm -hmm. and then um, um, just watching those guys, but I never got to participate. Like I never got to like get in the suit and really work them. I was a veterinary technician, so oh, nice. um, we just went and did the inspections for for the uh, for the military working dogs. So we did mm -hmm. all their health and stuff like that. But That's as far awesome. as the bite work, I was intrigued. I was intrigued by it, but I wasn't able to. They wouldn't let you like participate. You know, like sure, we'll, yeah. a guy yeah, who yeah. wants to do it now, we'll be like. Get in a suit. Hey, you can yeah. do this. And, yeah. uh, they, no, they wouldn't you know. let me do it. So, yeah, yeah. so I had to wait until I got out. I got out in uh, early part of 05. Later on, probably that same year, I met up with a bunch of guys here in Atlanta that was doing protection work. And I just saw it and I was like, oh, this is awesome. But they they didn't do any sport. They just did personal protection. Um, oh, yeah, and that's kind of what I... What I saw, like law enforcement, port, personal protection, military dogs, stuff like that. So I wasn't really familiar with the crispness of the sport. You know how you have to, the precision yeah. part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, <clears throat> um, from 06 to present, I've been training dogs and slowly um, getting better at it, you know. But That's good, it's man. not like cookie cutter. You, you, you're developing all the time learning new stuff, so... I mean that's that's another form how much, of how education. Much... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. How much would you say that uh going to the Nipopo classes helped you and elevated your career? You know, that's a really good question. Um I can tell you from my perspective, it definitely helped tremendously. I can't really quantify it. You know, because it's one of those things that is hard to mm -hmm. to um, quantify and go, you know, it's 10, 10 percent, 20 percent, 50 percent. But, um, you know, I'll kind of give you sort of a brief rundown of, of what I learned there and my perspective on Nepopo and how it helped me. So I noticed that, you know, prior to going to Nepopo, I was doing pretty decent. You know, I wasn't I wasn't terrible. By, by any means, I was doing pretty good. And what I saw with uh, with the Popo uh, students, the Popo training, um, I saw a lot of the same things that that um, you know that you see really good dog trainers do. So I, I, I remember thinking, wonder what it is that that makes this different. So when I went there. Um, you know, I went to silver and gold. When I went there, when I just went to silver, because silver is just theory. When I went to silver, um, I learned that the Nepopo system was about um, an intellectual form of learning for the trainer and for the dog. 
Uh, you know, it, it's, mm. it wasn't as much, um, you know, repetitions, although that has a lot to do with it, but it was, it was a very intellectual learning uh, experience, you know, going to, going to silver. Uh, and then going to gold obviously was, you know, like the cherry on top. It was, it was more intellectual training plus the, the physical application. And I can tell you, um, one of the biggest things that I, that I took away from the popo is that, you know, one, it's okay to, to, uh, to make mistakes in the training process. Even when you're training a client dog or a, or your own dog. You know, as dog trainers, we're very, we're always looking for the for the good rep. Always looking for the good repetition. And one thing that dog trainers always say is, you know, we want to end it on a good note. We want to end it on a good note. It has to be a good training session. And like we're just obsessed. Every dog trainer is, every dog handler is. When we have a training session, mm -hmm. we want the training session to go smooth. We want the training session to go well. If the dog has any obstacles, we want the dog to overcome those obstacles and end the training session with a bang so that when we put the dog away, it was a good session. We feel good about ourselves. The dog feels good. But what I learned is this. It is that bad sessions also have their place. You know? And that was part of the, the intellectual piece that I got from Nepopo, which is... You learn, it's part of deep practice. You learn when you screw up, you know? Yes. You are learning when you're having bad repetitions as well. Now, our goal shouldn't be to have bad sessions, but I went mm -hmm. from, you know, being upset about the bad sessions to I became more intrigued about the sessions that didn't go well. And I remember thinking after that, you know, after Nepopo, I remember thinking, you know, these bad sessions are good because one thing I've noticed, and I've noticed this in the past, and I know you have too, sometimes you're teaching a dog something, right? And it takes you a while and you go, man, we're, we're teaching this and we're teaching this and we're teaching this. And what happens is for like two or three sessions, the dog will have a bad session. The dog just doesn't get it. And then you pull the dog out later or the next day. And the dog also has a bad session. It's like they're not getting it. And you pull the dog the next day, and same thing. It seems like the dog is not getting it. Then the fourth or fifth session, you pull the dog out, and suddenly it's like in their sleep, they figure it out. Have you ever experienced that? I know I have. Yes, you know, I know like, exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, when you, when you think of that, when you see that, you think to yourself, oh, you know, um, I guess the dog figure it out. But if we look at it from a broader perspective what happened was those bad sessions did give the dog the deep practice that it needed you know it did give the dog the bad sessions and the failure so to speak that it needed to correct it for that one session that finally it figured it out and i've seen dogs i've seen that multiple times where you know you take the dog out to do a session and you think to yourself He's probably not going to do well because he didn't do well the past couple of sessions and they get it. And it's like suddenly they, they figure it out in their sleep or something. Um, so Nepopo kind of really put that together uh, for me and they, and they explained it in a way that makes sense. And then I was like, ah, that's what that is. I know that's just a piece, obviously. You know, there's, there's more that I got out of it. But I can tell you when I, when I finished Silver, and I came back home, you know, mm -hmm. to to work, and I still had clients. Uh, I had some of my club members, some of my clients, even tell me, "Hey, you know, you do, you do look, your training does look a little bit different. It's like it's, it's like you're excited about training." And same thing when I finished gold, same thing. I I, I came back, and uh, I can tell my club members' dogs even, you know, got the edge that my dogs got as well. So um, it definitely was a, a, a tremendous boost in my, in my career, you know, for the stage that I'm in. You know, there are people that go to silver and gold that have much, much less experience, you know, than, than, uh, than either of us. And uh, some, of, some of the people that went to silver and gold are very, very new to dog training. So their journey is different. You know, their, what they got out of it is probably different than what I, I got out of it. And that's the, that was the great thing about it.
So, yeah, yeah, I've been hearing a lot about that um, program. I know a lot of people who went through it, and um, I just feel like it's something that they have that a lot of other dog trainers don't have. Like, there's a tier that they're above a little bit. You know what I'm saying? As far as yeah. Um, the understanding of how the dog understands, if that makes sense, if that if yeah, makes the dog or getting him to learn. Yeah, it's a very intellectual right. process. So, I try to, um, I try to like when even when I'm training my dog, I have a dog. I don't know if you've seen him that time when we was in Florida, but I got my PDC. I think when when um, when you were there, mm -hmm. and I think you came like the second day or something. Yeah, I but, went uh, there, yeah. yeah, so so we went on and um everything went fairly well. And so he was young. I think he was what's the youngest whatever the youngest Four, age you can be months. doing. Be, he was like right at 14, 15 months, something like that. So yes. he got his PC, looked amazing doing it. So I was That's like, awesome. okay, we're gonna have a a breeze going through the ones. So mm -hmm. Um, I just start training more and training more. And then when I got to the point to where you have to put the decoy on the field, the decoy has to move and he has to have a lot of, uh, yeah. not a lot, but decoy neutrality to an yeah, extent. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I didn't, um, he didn't do too well on that. He started getting more obsessive about the decoy, more, yeah. you know, like into that. So that gave me a little hurdle. And then I started figuring out like, it's not a sprint. You know what I'm saying? Like I'll I'll take my time. He's already 14 months. I'll take a year off and work on these few problems, and then we'll go back and attack that. And by that time, he should be ready. I should soon after be able to start the twos if he takes to the training well. I mean, to get your uh, to get your PDC at 14 months of age, 15 months of age, that's really good. That's a young dog. You know, a lot of dogs are not even mentally ready for that, and even for a PDC, sometimes until they're about, you know, close to two. So uh, the fact that you were able to get your dog to a PDC, um, you know, at 14 months, 15 months, that's, I mean, that's really good. That's very impressive. And look good at it, you know, look good doing it. Because a lot of people get their PDCs and you could see it like they barely skim by. Um, so, no, that's good. Yep, yeah, I posted it on Facebook. Uh it looked pretty good. He kept his focus the whole time, even with the gunfire. Everything was fairly decent. I started my own uh, PSA club probably – we were only at it for 10 months at that time and when we went to the trial. We were only a club for 10 months. And so we went down with seven dogs, and five of us passed our PDCs um, within 10 months of doing sport, you know. Um I think it also helped that I uh, I was doing – I do my own competition called the Throwdown. And so I think that helped out a lot, um, being able to do that. And I'm a judge there. So I kind of know what I want to see. And then I try to transfer that into uh, PSA. So I was just – you asked me about the puppy and how old it was, like uh, – the new right. dog that I have that I'm going to be trying. It's actually a son of my uh, dog that I'm competing with now. Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah, so he's about 12, 13 weeks now. Okay, he's a young, young pup. Yeah, I'm just starting and, off his uh, obedience right now. Dude, that's awesome. So you got the father and the son, and you're going to be – and you're not – you're still competing with the dad, right? Yeah, he only got his PDC. He should be going for his ones right. sometime uh, first quarter of 2023. Nice. Yeah, That's so I awesome. took I took a whole year off just to dedicate to getting them neutral to the decoy. So we'll see how that works. Yeah. I'm sure it will. Um, what... Um... What lines is your – well, both of them because they're father and son. Are they so Dutch? He's actually a bull herder. So we're just being honest about okay. what's in the dog, if that makes sense. So he looks like uh, 
His 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 dad is a dog named Deuce from Bull Vision Kennels. I don't know if you see them. They on Must Must TV a lot. Um, Scott and Chloe from the mm-hmm. UK. So I imported okay. him, and he's uh he's a bull herder. His mom's a Mal. His dad's a pit bull presser. Uh, Mal mix. No kidding. It's like a three way cross. And then I bred him okay. back to my female Mal, which made the puppy. Oh, nice. That'll be an interesting uh, combination for the puppy. Yeah, they look like Malinois. You can't really tell the difference. They're just a little bit more cheeky. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, dude, that's awesome. Yeah, so so, um, I'm on this PSA journey. Um, Thinking of talk, going back to something that you said earlier about the the dog on uh, the decoy. That's kind of my real, real like passion to this um and that's something that i love doing like if i can do anything i would just do decoy or teach decoy and i would be cool with doing that um i want to go and get my psa you know the certification i did it the appda one and i was doing some helper work mm-hmm. in uh igp but uh it seems like a, a crossfit challenge nowadays <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> I'm 40 years old and my knees hurt. Yeah. I mean, I do jujitsu, but that's something that you can control. Like I can lay down on the ground, I can squat, you know, and and control the way my yeah. knees tweaking. When a dog's coming at I I still catch him. It's just the how long you have to be on the field. Yeah. Um I don't know. I, we was talking about um eco was, work. Eco. Go right. ahead. Go ahead. Start. Just, yeah, so I'll, I'll start from the I'll start from the top. I'll, I'll start again. So, you know, the thing that that is interesting about decoy work is when you're new, when you're brand new at it, and you have all the interest, you're very excited. Typically, you know, your body can handle, you know, the the uh, the beatings, right? So when you're young, you're new at it. A lot of young decoys are really athletic, really good, mm-hmm. and. Um, and that's where your skill and your knowledge is at its lowest, but you're good at, you know, learning the, you know, learning the mechanics of decoy work. So when you're new at it, you're young, you typically make a, you know, a good prop, right? Make a good prop. And, uh, and this allows you to learn more and more and more. Cause you know, that's the thing about decoy work is we can go, Hey, we need decoys. And as long as the decoy understands certain basic movements, we can train our dogs as long as they're safe or bad, right? right? Then what happens is in your journey, you gain experience, you gain knowledge, you, uh, you learn to read dogs much, much better as you learn all of this, as you practice over and over and over. The more you practice, the more you learn, the more your body also kind of starts to decline. And so when you get to the point of, you know, you, you're really good at, you, you can read things, you can read the dog, you know, you know almost what the dog's going to do before that dog is even sent. Mm-hmm. You get to that point, you know, your body is typically not at its most optimal. You know, you're talking about people like Barb Alone, Dave Croyer. And there are many others, of course, but, you know, just using those two as examples, these are people that, are at a point where they, their their knowledge of deco work is is so you know so far beyond a lot of us, but yet their bodies are no longer there. It's like in the beginning, your your physical ability is here, your knowledge is typically here, mm-hmm. and then as your knowledge rises, your body is then typically down here, and that's just one of the uh, you know the the ironies. And the sad realities of deco work is the more knowledge that you gain, the more experience you gain, the less your body can handle because it's taken so many beatings to get to that point of experience. Right. Um, that, you know, that's, it's a fascinating part about deco work. I still love it too. You know, I freaking love deco work. Um, but, I'm realizing now that, you know, I do have an achy shoulder, you know, that was, that was due to a, an injury during a training session. I have a, an achy right knee that was also due to, uh, you know, something that happened. 
And I always have to decor around those two injuries. So, um, you know, it's just one of those things that at our age, you know, we have to kind of keep an eye out for. Right. Yeah, man. I'm, um, shucks, two knees, ankle, back. I still, yeah, like I said, jujitsu kind of keeps me feeling young, but, um, working dogs is harder to, like control the impact, the way the dog's going to move. And sometimes the dogs, you know, when you're doing fin dogs, they're biting legs and Mm -hmm. jerking on your knees. And so it's not that I don't want to, I really, this is like a bucket list thing of mine. I'm definitely want to just commit like two years after, you know, doing a couple of trials and then I'll be done. I just, this is something that I want to do, you know. It's fun. It certainly is fun. Yep, yep, yep. So um who would you say like if you had a if if I was new to dog training and I had to follow uh either a certain type of system or a person, give me like three people that um that you would recommend to I need to be looking at these people if I'm in a dog training industry and I want to uh broaden my knowledge. That is a really good question. Um, now you're talking about dog training, like pet training, or are you talking about more like sport training or, or something more broad in general? Um, both. Um, just say, just say for now, just dog training in general. But sport is kind of what I'm, I'm looking at because sport trainers are, uh, they're good pet trainers, most of them. Yeah. 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 Okay. So. Um, there is a uh, there is a there are a few people that I that I've been watching and following for a very long time, and I've been watching and following a bunch of different trainers. But then, you know, as as you kind of get to see uh, what they're about, as you get kind of get to gain your knowledge, you start to realize, oh no, no, those people are they were okay then, but now I, you narrow down your list to like a handful of people, so. One trainer, he's not a sport trainer, um, but he is one that that definitely has had an influence on me from the time that I started training dogs. Is his name is Mike DeBruzzo. Mm-hmm. He's a trainer in New York, and his business name is uh, K91. So he trains pet dogs. He's a balanced trainer. It's a balanced trainer with emphasis on, uh, you know, a, a little bit more on the on the softer, more positive side. <clears throat> He's not a purely positive trainer. Uh, mm-hmm. He does use tools, but he's more on the, uh, you know, on the positive side. He's very, very, um, he's very aware of the, uh, you know, of the, or very conscious rather of the, you um, you know, the, the approach um, and, and the stress that training can have on the dog. So he's very, very, uh, like I said, a little bit more on the, on the positive side without being purely positive. So he's one that I follow for a while, one that has influenced me as a trainer, Mike DeBruzzo, Canine One. Um, another one that, uh, that I have uh, learned a lot from is Dave Croyer. Dave Croyer, hands down. Um, you know, I, I've talked to him, I've, I've, I've met with him, uh, I've had the privilege to, to, uh, you know, train with him, um, you know, w- working his dogs, decoying for his dogs. And, uh, and the guy's just incredibly knowledgeable and mm-hmm. very, very skilled. And he is an amazing sport trainer. He's a judge for Mondial Ring. He has title in level threes in in uh, you know in uh, in French ring, and he has gone to uh, he has competed at a very high level in IGP. So the guy is very multifaceted when it comes to sport training, and and also a really really good pet trainer as well. So Dave Croyer is definitely another one that has had a huge influence on my training style and continues to have an influence on my training style. Um, and then obviously the the other one that I'm definitely going to recommend just because of how much i got out of the training style in the system uh is barton michael balone with the napopa system um those are the uh you know the handful of people that to this day 
um, you know, continue to have an influence on me and have uh, sort of shaped my training style. Okay. Yeah, that's a good list. If I was thinking uh, at least two of those three, like I didn't know about the the first guy you named, but yeah, definitely um, Bart Bell and Dave Corey. I have him on on um yeah on yeah. on one episode of um you know of this podcast yeah um yeah, i saw him he's he's really uh knowledgeable about a lot of stuff um yeah i definitely fell into the like the sinkhole with bart bell and and i started i don't know it's probably eight years ago and that i was really like just trying to find anything that I can find on them, um, get any information. Anybody who went to the silver or gold class at the time, I couldn't afford it. So I was like, oh, mm-hmm. you know, but, uh, and then I always had something going on. But if I'm, I'm not mistaken, <laughs> they're done doing that, right? In the States? So the the way they're doing it is they were doing the uh, silver and gold themselves. They were certifying the silver graduates and the and the gold graduates themselves. But what's happening is this year is this year is the last time that they're doing that. There are a few classes they still have to finish, mm-hmm. but them already have finished. Um, but what's going to happen now, uh, from you know from here on out, they will do the silver classes. Mm-hmm. But then, if like you know, like if you wanted to, you know, go to silver, you could still go to silver, get the training, the silver training through them. Mm-hmm. But to get the gold, the gold certificate, there you'll have to go to a gold graduate. You know what I mean, and, and do training with them, do whatever program that they offer to sort of continue that. You know that that training, and it definitely is not. It seems like it would be. You know, oh, it's completely different. It's not the same. Definitely, it's not the same. But what you get out of silver, the intellectual and just, you know, just the knowledge that they give you in silver, that alone is very, very, uh, you know, drastically different than what we're used to. Okay. So, I mean, I, I know there are trainers that just went to silver and, you know, they got a lot out of just going to silver. It's not like, you know, you, you're necessarily – missing out it definitely is a benefit to finish gold but uh but that's the way they're going to move forward after this year okay okay cool i always thought about um going just because i just wanted to just something i want to do after seeing so many people go through it and come out you know yeah um and then you got you know you got justin rigney that is doing seminars like he's he seems like he's doing a seminar every weekend yeah, I, <laughs> me and Justin, Justin are pretty cool. So yeah. I, um, uh, I, uh, listen to every class that he does when he's at the Hits Conference for the last two or three years, and then, um, uh, any time that I have a chance to go, I'll probably you know go hang out yeah. with him. But I definitely like uh, uh, get his ear when I can. You know, like pick yeah. his brain a little bit when I can. Um, yeah. Yeah, man, I, I definitely uh, know that that's something that you have to do. You have to, like, put yourself around people that are more knowledgeable than you are, like, or has had more success doing things than you have. So, because I am I started a club, and I was the leader without knowing a whole lot mm-hmm. about the sport. I know about dog training, but, you know, how to yeah. know your uh-huh. points, know where you lose points, Who you know. Some exactly. people go as far as the judges and like who to show and judge with and what they like yeah. and what they don't like. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. I I haven't got that deep into it yet. But uh, well, we'll I'm gonna see. I'm gonna tell you something. When um when I started the club, I started very similar to the way you started it. You know, I didn't have really any knowledge of the sport, but the thing that helped me and helped my club in turn was certifying as a PSA decoy going mm-hmm. to the certification camp you learn so much about the sport because you know to certify as a decoy you have to really know the sport you have to know how to test the dogs what to look for so the certification camp alone knowledge wise is incredibly valuable for you as a handler and for your club furthermore 
if you certify and you start going to trials as a decoy and the knowledge that you get as far as points, uh, you know, uh, what the judge is looking for, um, that boosts your knowledge of the sport tremendously. So my sport, my club got better. My dog and, and the club, uh, the club dogs got way better because we knew exactly what we needed to work towards once mm -hmm. I certified as a decoy. And once I started going to trials, because you really get to see the sport from a different perspective. It's like, you're seeing it from behind the curtains. Okay. How many, um, how many club members do you have? You know, right now, it's not like consistent necessarily, but roughly between like eight to about 10 club members. More that, or seems, less. that seems normal. That seems like the yeah. average. Um, when you think and you see like all these big clubs, have you trained with Derek at all? Derek um, Rose. Rose? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've gone to his club. I've trained with him. Um, a while back i haven't been back in a you know in, in like a year but yeah yeah i've trained with them yeah it's something i need to do too i just need to start traveling i need to get out get around people who are more involved in sport and definitely you know heighten my game because i think i can i think that i can get a three on a dog um whether it's this dog or not i don't know but i think because of the stuff that we were doing before it's not that far off like I have a competition called the Throwdown. If you go mm -hmm. win in level two, which is the highest level outside of the puppies, it's pretty, it's a lot of pressure. You know, it's a lot of pressure on you, the dog, it's a lot of distractions, the dog's off leash, you know, multiple decoys. Um, it's not a whole lot different. You know, the mm -hmm. only thing is we don't do like the retrieve and stuff and the scenarios are more personal protection base like kind of realistic sure. but as far as the control that you have on the dog like people who tr were training with me before they would be able to do just say you were able to do a psa two to three routine but loosely like you mm -hmm. didn't have focus heel wasn't like critiquing so much on your dog's speed of the down speed of the recall sure. just i just wanted it to be functional and then mm -hmm. i judge a little more harsh on the control part when there's like innocent bystanders around or your sure. dog bit the wrong person. That's where you got, you know, more of your points deducted and just the dog being able to handle certain pressure, go, uh, his environmentals have to be strong, stuff like that. But I feel like I can go ahead. And you, org you organize that. Yes, I did. It's been Dude, ten, that's awesome. 10 years now that we've been going. So if you look, you can I'll just have search. To check it out. Yes, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. Like if you search um, uh, just the Throwdown K9 competition on Facebook, you'll see a bunch of videos of it. Okay, okay. I'm going to have, I'm interested now. I'm going to have to really check it out. Sounds, yes. So this is our 10th really cool. year in it. So um, it's been going pretty good. It'll be March 18th this coming up uh, year. Nice. In, in Georgia. So if you want to find something to do, yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I'll check it out. Yeah, a lot of gun shooting, smoke bombs and you know a lot of crazy stuff but um you also have to have um some pretty decent uh, obedience to be honest most of the people who've won have excelled in sports so um amanda calderon she won she had a psa3 on the dog she won with um the girl last year who won heather she was an apa dog she's titled an apa and then Two years in a row, I think Cammy won. She has a PSA two dog, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh Javier in Florida with Killer. I think that's his dog's name, Killer. Um, he was in the top dogs. If he didn't, I don't know if he won or not. But I think he got second. But yeah, he um oh, nice. You know, mostly sport dogs do pretty well. Like, um, you know, the only part that I feel like they fail on is when they're alone. So like, if you have to like leave him in the car or protect something, you know what I'm saying? And he's alone and he's not being told to bite. That's the yeah. only discrepancy where, <laughs> I see. Um, you know, yeah. there's a, a difference, but you know, then I feel like once you get higher level in sport, they're not 
good at judging when you're in danger. You got what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. yeah they kind of lose that. They're like, oh, I'm supposed to stay here and my own. <laughs> you know? Right, right. Yeah, but other than that, man, it's pretty cool. Like, um, PSA is probably the closest sport to to being able to do something to what I like. Um, you know, the APPDA thing is going on, and that's that's getting some motion. I just hope they move around a little bit more, and then uh, where I can get closer to them instead of them being like way in New York and stuff. Yeah, but yeah. You get like within six hours, five or six hours, I might start traveling right yep that's the thing about doing sports you do a lot of driving a whole lot and then you gotta take your family i just try to make it out of trips now like <laughs> you know uh yeah bring you bring your kids bring your family especially yeah. if you're going to florida it's easy to relax while you're out there yeah yep. yep so um man just let the people know what where they can reach you like your facebook sure. your instagram and you know yeah well, um, you know, first, thank you very much for uh, having me on your podcast, man. I really appreciate it. It's an honor. Uh, and yeah, if people want to uh, see more of uh, my training or some of the content that I post, it's dog training is my passion. And that is the, uh, that's the handle for Facebook, Instagram, uh, YouTube, and also podcasts. I also have a podcast, Dog Training is My Passion. So, um, you know, any, any podcast platform that you want to go to, if you look up dog training is my passion, it's, it's going to be, you know, content made by me. So cool. Cool. And I'm going to make sure I tag that and put that in the, um, the links, uh, when I post this, so it's going to go on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, everywhere. There's a podcast. You'll be able to listen to it. Yes, and, um, also this video version will be on, on youtube and i'll add those links and also tag like all your book information on amazon thank you very much so um hopefully we'll get to meet up link up and train sometime um yeah yeah take a road trip out there what part of texas are you in i'm in this tiny tiny little town um in the middle of nowhere so it's about three hours south of dallas mm -hmm. and about two hours north of austin okay so Kind of between Dallas and Austin. Okay, I heard I heard Austin is a nice place to go. Yeah, I mean it's got it's got some nice it's a nice touristic area. It's it's not bad. It's nice. I don't go there very often, but but yeah, it's it's not bad. So, is there any tourist spots to go around where you are? No, <laughs> not, not where I am. Like it's literally uh, it's a tiny little town. We have one traffic light, uh, you know, one school. And like the, the, the graduating class is like five, five students that graduated. It's, it's a very tiny town. You see people riding their horses on the street. What's, what's your nationality? Uh, Peruvian. Okay. okay. I, was, I was born in Peru. Okay. I thought you were like Native American for a second. And I was no, like, oh, no. maybe he's close <laughs> to like, a, I don't know if there's like cool. reserves out there, but I know in Louisiana yeah, we know. have one. And like, I think it's in Homa, Indian. Oh, nice. Oh, Native nice. American. Yeah. But yeah, man. So we'll wrap it up with that. And All right. Well, thank um, you. Yeah, I'll be in touch, man. If I uh, if I need something, I might reach out to you. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, absolutely. You're welcome. All right. You have a nice one, bro. Take it easy. All right. Take care. Bye. All right.